from a opium overdose or any overdose actually naltrexone and naloxone uh, you can use uh, to uh, if you inject individuals who have uh, who have overdosed on, on opium or heroin or any opioid or opium opiate or opioid then you it will stop the, the reaction and uh, you'll actually bring them back to life which is kind of exciting um, another uh, substance that works as a uh, opioid agonist is buprenorphine I, this stuff we don't use this stuff in the United States so we use naltrexone and, and naloxone uh, but this stuff works I mean it, it does work it's uh, uh, they use it in Europe. It's a powerful opioid agonist at low doses, but at high doses it becomes an opioid antagonist. Uh, <clears throat> at low doses it, it's used as an analgesic substitute for morphine. Uh, it is 50 times stronger than heroin, so it's pretty strong stuff. At high doses, it has an inverse agonistic effect and will block opioids from receptor sites for up to 30 hours. I don't have any good news for you today. I apologize for that. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to show you some people that have overdosed. Uh, I'm going to show you a lot of people that have overdosed. Most of them are in the inter entertainment industry. Uh, all of them are, actually. Some of them are, are musicians, a lot of musicians, uh, who do stupid things from time to time, just to have a good time. Uh, so for a good time, you know, shoot up with opium or, or uh, heroin or whatever. At high doses, it can be used as a part of an opioid treatment regimen because it blocks the effects of the opioids while locking the edge, uh, knocking, <laughs> taking the edge off of some of the side effects. Uh, clonidine uh, catapress uh, is often used to diminish nausea, anxiety, diarrhea from opioid uh, withdrawal symptoms. Uh, it also reduces your opioid craving. Uh, this is used in the United States. I've used this stuff, but not on me, of course, but I've used it on other individuals uh, who were going through uh, opioid withdrawals. Uh, it reduces the overactivity of the norepinephrine receptors and can cut withdrawal time in half. Uh, used in uh, conjunction with naltrexone, uh, it can uh, reduce withdrawal recovery from one month to five days. So clonidine, uh, pretty good stuff, or catapress. Uh, Catapress is another name for it. Stadol and Ultram are new uh, synthetic opioids. Uh, they were developed uh, because they're less abusable uh, and they were thought to be less addictive, but it turns out that if you... It, 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 <laughs> these guys can, uh, can use these drugs and, and make them addictive uh, somehow. Uh, anyway, they are, they are abusable and people will use them uh, and abuse them. Uh, so this chapter is not only about opiates and opioids, it's also about sedative hypnotics. Uh, there's two major categories of sedative hypnotics, uh, benzodiazepines and barbiturates. Benzodiazepines in include uh, Xanax and Clonopin. Um, the barbiturates are the, are the barbitols, uh, secobarbital, phenobarbital, pentobarbital. <clears throat> Uh, and, and in the old days, actually, these were used a lot, uh, especially in the 40s and 50s, barbiturates were really popular. Uh, Judy Garland was a big uh, barbiturate user. Uh, she was an upper-downer type person. They gave her amphetamines to wake up in the morning, they gave her barbiturates at night. And eventually she overdosed on barbiturates. Just under half of all prescriptions for psychiatric medications are written for antidepressants. Uh, the first sedatives were bromides, also used as anticonvulsants in the 1850s. Uh, so it was used for, for uh, children with, uh, with epilepsy. Uh, the biggest uh, problem with these drugs was the fact that they have a long uh, half-life, so toxic levels could build up in your body. And this is the biggest problem. If you, the doctors will give you a, a, a prescription for them, uh, and you take them, and you take them uh, as long as they tell you to take them, and eventually you're, you'll build up a level, a uh, toxic level in your, in your system. Uh, really all depends on who you are, it all depends on how, how well your liver is doing, uh, how much uh, body fat you're, you're maintaining, uh, as to how 
quickly this stuff will build up in your system. Around the American Civil War, chloral hydrate started being used as a sleep aid and a sedative. Uh, was used to treat tension, pain, insomnia caused by alcoholism, and pregnancy neuroses. Uh, this is one of the things that we noticed. Uh, of course, we've all, this has always been around uh, uh, women uh, give birth to a baby, and uh, sometimes they have a very negative reaction to the pregnancy. Uh, sometimes it's, it's just uh, neuroses. Uh, sometimes it turns into a psychosis. Uh, they, they go off the deep end and they never come back. Uh, so we have always looked for something that we could treat them with. Uh, and uh, of course they've tried uh, just about everything. Chloral hydrate was what they were using. Uh, using the chloral hydrate, it just knocks them out. That's all it does. It's a sedative. It just, it just wipes them out. As a matter of fact, uh, chloral hydrate uh, was used as uh, the, the infamous Mickey Finn. Uh, it is the drug that, we, that uh, was used to knock men out uh, so that they could Shanghai them. And what they were doing, uh, they were finding them in bars. You know, they were drunk already. They, were, they gave them chloral hydrate, which turns out to be three molecules of alcohol. They were knocking them out, and two days after, uh, two days later, they'd wake up. And of course, two days later, they'd be 150 miles from San Francisco, uh, sailing across the Pacific Ocean. And that's they would Shanghai people this way by knocking them out with uh, with Mickey fins. In 1882, physicians began using peraldehyde uh, to control alcohol withdrawal symptoms. Um, Acetylaldehyde, one of the things that alcohol breaks down into in your stomach is acetylaldehyde. Uh, so they started using, and of course it doesn't taste very good. I don't know if you've, if you've ever, if you ever try alcohol and you burp, a lot of times it tastes like you're, you just drank a glass of formaldehyde. And that's because the acetylaldehyde is, is coming up into your, into your system. It doesn't taste very good. Well, this stuff doesn't taste very good either. It stinks. It smells like formaldehyde is what it smells like. Uh, and of course, formaldehyde's poison. You can't, it's not like you can drink that stuff. It's not like you can do anything with it. Uh, it's poison, and you will, you will poison yourself uh, if you drink, try to drink formaldehyde. Anyway, this formaldehyde, uh, they use this uh, to control uh, alcohol withdrawal symptoms. Um, it, is, it does have uh, addictive properties, and, it's, and like I said before, it smells bad. Uh, so if you can handle the, the bad smell. Some people don't smell things. I know that seems kind of weird, but uh, they've done studies, and what they discovered, some people don't smell body odors. Like a third of the population doesn't smell body odors, which seems kind of odd to me. Uh, so some people are sensitive to smells, other people aren't sensitive to smells. Uh, so you'd hope to give that stuff to somebody who's not sensitive to smells. Barbiturates uh, were first uh, developed at the end of the 19th century and uh, they became very popular into the 1930s and 1940s. If you watch an old movie from the 1930s, uh, they may mention uh, the, uh, you know, secobarbital or phenobarbital or whatever. Uh, I can remember several movies where, where uh, they, they mention this stuff, and it's, you know, they gave it to their mother so that she'd go to sleep, you know, that kind of thing. Barbiturates are any compound synthesized uh, from bar barbituric acid, uh, phenobarbital, psychobarbital, phena, uh, uh, pentobarbital, uh, all the barbitals are, uh, are barbiturates. These substances are highly addictive and fairly toxic, making them fairly dangerous, and for this reason, uh, the doctors had to, to uh, uh, control their usage. Keep an eye on them. People wanted to use them to, to uh, if their nerves got a little agitated, they'd want to take this stuff. Rather than take a snort of, uh, of whiskey, they would uh, they just take a a, uh, a a drink of their phenobarbital or whatever. Um, Milltown or meprobamate uh, was used fairly extensively as a sedative. Uh, later, this was in the 1940s and 1950s, it kind of uh, replaced uh, barbiturates because barbiturates were so, uh, 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 so addictive. Uh, became known as, uh, to housewives as Mother's Little Helper. Uh, the Rolling Stones sang a song about Mother's Little Helper. They were talk talking about somebody's mother. 
uh, was a was a big uh, Milltown user, and uh, of course she was she was hooked on the stuff. So the, uh, if you listen to the songs from the 1960s, of course, you'll hear about Mothers of the Helper, especially if you listen to the Rolling Stones. <laughs> Less dangerous than barbiturates, uh, uh, it maintained its popularity until the 1960s. At, uh, uh, at that time, it was replaced by benzodiazepines, uh, which were a little bit less addictive. We were worried about this. We were worried about addicting people to these, these drugs. Uh, people were going into insane asylums because they were addicted to this stuff. Uh, it was kicking them into psychosis. It was they were uh, having neurotic uh, uh, breakdowns, uh, and so we were afraid of that. So uh, here we are. We're trying to treat people. We want to make everybody feel better. Uh, so then the benzodiazepines came came along, and we decided to to switch to that stuff. Uh, Doradin uh, was also used as a barbiturate substitute. Unfortunately, it, is, it was weaker than phenobarbital. It was just as addictive as barbiturates. Uh, and because of that, of course, they thought it was, you know, it's, it's like everything else. We think, we think we've got something to replace something else, and it turns out not to be, not to work. And this stuff didn't work. Uh, it was more addictive, and it was not as, it was weaker than the, uh, than the phenobarbital it was supposed to replace. So uh, we don't use this stuff anymore. You can still find it in uh, Asia. You can still find it in, uh, in Europe. Uh, real popular in uh, Turkey, strangely enough. Uh, this is the stuff that, uh, that we used during the Vietnam War, uh, Librium and Valium. Uh, Librium uh, was the first benzodiazepine developed in 1954. Uh, it was used as a muscle relaxant. Uh, it was uh, used as a sedative hypnotic. Uh, diazepam or Valium, uh, <laughs> uh, these two drugs, Valium and Librium, uh, dominated the uh, sedative hypnotic market until the invention of Prozac. Uh, I think I told you the story of uh, working in the, uh, in the pharmacy uh, and we would get uh, almost everything in gallon, gallon jars uh, except for Valium and Librium and we got them in five gallon buckets. Uh, just the weirdest thing you ever saw. They would. They'd scoop them out with one of those big scoops that you use for candy, you know, it was crazy. Uh, they were thought to be uh, good alternatives to the highly addictive barbiturates. Benzodiazepines proved to be very addictive themselves, they were just as dangerous withdrawals as barbiturates. Uh, so we thought we, we had it fixed, but uh, we were wrong. So all those, uh, all those wives and military personnel that we threw all those pills at, uh, we were juicing them up. We were, we were making them uh, addicted uh, to something else. And this is really kind of a sad story because medicine keeps trying, pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical companies keep trying to come up with, with an answer to this problem. And a lot of times the, their answer is, is not an answer at all. It's just another problem. Uh, they've just created another problem. Uh, disuvia. Why, why in the world have they come up with disuvia? Is this an answer to a problem or is this just a worse problem that we're going to have? We thought that fentanyl was the answer to, a, to the opioid crisis. Nobody can take this stuff, it's too strong. Well, it hasn't worked. Uh, it's still getting out on the streets and, and it's, it's killing people. China White. <laughs> Today there are several new drugs that are being ad advertised as less addictive. You can see this stuff on television. Uh, they, they advertise this stuff on television, not Boost Bar or Rosarim, but uh, Lunesta, Ambient, and Lyrica. Ambient, of course, is used as a, uh, as a sleeping pill. Actually, all uh, these two are used as sleeping pills. I just saw an advertisement for Lyrica last night. Uh, if, you're, if your antidepressant's not working, then you need to talk to your doctor about Lyrica. That's what they were, they were talking about. <clears throat> Not a very good idea. Only Boost Bar and Rosarim uh, have uh, pro proven to be less addictive. Uh, the Lunesta, which is used as a sleeping pill, the Ambien, of course, is just as addictive as anything else. Sure. Uh, once upon a time in a land far, far away, uh, I had a student who was hooked on Ambien. She couldn't sleep. She had insomnia. Or at least she claimed she had insomnia. So she had to take Ambien in order to go to sleep. Well, pretty soon that Ambien didn't work. So she took two. That worked. And then pretty soon the two didn't work, so she had to take three. 
But of course, the doctor was prescribing her one. So she would, uh, she only was sleeping every third night when she could take all three of her Ambien. Uh, we, we discussed it, and eventually she got off this stuff. But uh, she had a really difficult time sleeping. She didn't think she was sleeping. What she was doing, she was laying down, and she was thinking, and she was thinking, and she was thinking. She was falling asleep for a couple hours, then she'd wake back up with her thought exactly where it was before. She didn't think she was sleeping. She didn't realize she was sleeping. Uh, anyway, we, we figured it out. She's OK now. And uh, uh, she got married and, <laughs> and had a couple babies. Everything's, everything's better. Everything's much better than it was before. Sedative hypnotics proved to be uh, so addictive that they, their use waxed and waned over the years. Uh, at this point in time, benzodiazepines are used sparingly and they have been replaced by psychiatric medications that are less addictive and there is a lower possibility of adding them to other medications to get a high. And of course that's what they were doing before, taking Xanax and then drinking it with alcohol and, uh, and getting a, a, an adverse reaction. However, sedative hypnotics can still be abused, uh, especially if the drug is overused uh, when prescribed by a physician, just like my, my student. Uh, it is used in combination with, with other psychiatric substances for the synergistic effect or counter, uh, counteractive effect. Uh, she would uh, drink, uh, drink it with, uh, she'd take the, the pills with alcohol and she'd get a synergistic effect. She tried that uh, to go to sleep and, and actually she had the opposite effect. It kept her up, but it made her feel like she needed to stay away. The drugs are borrowed or stolen from someone or as a form of self-medication. I can remember the day she came to, to, uh, to class and she was screaming about the fact that somebody had stolen her ambient. And she had enough for the rest of the month and she, now she didn't have any at all. And she didn't, she didn't think she could go and talk to the, uh, uh, to the doctor and get more. It's kind of interesting. She'd done it before, of course. She was trying to get more drugs. Uh, anyway, so she was really pissed. Uh, the person that stole her drugs, her roommate. It was her roommate who was going off to. Uh, that she, we lived in. We lived up on the up near the Canadian border, and she was headed to Great Falls, which is about 150 miles away. So she was. She went and hid in Great Falls until she used up all of her ammo. And then she came back. Uh, the drugs are obtained uh, by other legal means, uh, for example, forged prescriptions and buying on the black market. And of course, uh, uh, this, the other lady was going to use those drugs, but she could have sold them for a lot of money down in Great Falls. Uh, okay, this is this is a, a really really sad story. I apologize for showing you all these people that died of a drug overdose, but we need to understand that this is a very common problem and it can happen anytime, anywhere. The list of celebrities who have died from barbiturate overdoses is long. Uh, Marilyn Monroe had a high doses of Nibutol and chlorhydrate in her system when she died. Uh, she also drank, uh, she drank her pills down with alcohol. She got a synergistic effect from the Nibutol and of course chloral hydrate, as I said before, chloral hydrate is uh, three molecules of alcohol. So if you take chloral hydrate with alcohol, well you just, that's four molecules, that's, that's a lot of alcohol. So you, it's, you have a, a very adverse effect. This is Doroth Dorothy Dandridge. Uh, she had high levels of tricyclic antidepressant amipramine, also known as Tofranil, uh, when she was found dead. She overdosed. Jimi Hendrix, the famous guitar playing uh, gentleman from Seattle. Uh, he was a notorious drug mixer. He had high levels of psychobarbital in his system when he asphyxiated it on his own vomit. Uh, the drugs were prescribed to him, not prescribed to him, but to his girlfriend, and she gave him her drugs. Uh, he was 27 years old when he died. This, this gets interesting. <laughs> Bruce Lee, the quintessential martial arts expert, died from an allergic reaction to a painkiller containing aspirin and meprobamate. Meprobamate, Miltown. Freddie Prinze uh, shot himself uh, while under the influence of Quaaludes. Uh, Prince was the star of the hit sitcoms Chico and the Man. 
Uh, his uh, son is an actor as well, Freddie Prinze Jr. Okay. Elvis Presley was a notorious prescription pill mixer. When he died, he had 14 different drugs in his, in his system, including codeine, quaaludes, and methoquilone. Probably a mistake. Died on the toilet. Died on the toilet. <laughs> Keith Moon, here we go, Keith Moon. Keith Moon was a drummer for The Who. He was an alcoholic when he tried to clean up. Probably a big mistake. Uh, the drug he was using was a sedative, uh, clometh clomethiazole, uh, he had 10 times the daily dosage in his system when he died. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that all just 10 times, you know, that's enough to kill a rhinoceros. Uh, Abby Hoffman was a 60s anti-war activist. Uh, Hoffman was found with 150 tabs of phenobarbital in his stomach. Uh, his death was ruled a suicide. Who takes 150 tabs of phenobarbital? Uh, Steve Clark was lead uh, guitarist for Def Leppard. Uh, Clark was found by his girlfriend with respiratory failure uh, from the use of painkillers, Valium, antidepressants, and of course he mixed it all with alcohol and he got a synergistic effect from the painkillers and the Valium with the alcohol. Whoops! Margot Hemingway was an actress and the granddaughter of the iconic author Ernest Hemingway. Granddaughter Hemingway was found dead from an overdose of phenobarbital on the 35th anniversary of her grandfather's suicide. Her grandfather shot himself in the head with a shotgun, but Margot, of course, overdosed on phenobarbital. Very attractive young lady, as you can see. Rob Pilatus, uh, Millie, he was Millie of Millie Vanilli. Uh, Millie Vanilli was, they were supposed to be a singing group, but it turned out that they weren't singing any of their own songs. Uh, so they were, yeah, he was, uh, he was from Germany. Uh, he died of a heart attack induced by a sedative given to him to help with alcohol withdrawals. He was taking the drug with alcohol, which you're not supposed to do. Oh man, <clears throat> sorry. Dana Plato uh, was the actress from the, the sitcom Different Strokes. She died from a mixture of soma, which is a muscle relaxant, and Vicodin. Vicodin, of course, is an opi opioid. Uh, Plato had a long history of prescription drug abuse, and of course, uh, the, the, everybody on that show seems to have died, will not have died, but uh, have, has had problems with drugs, as weird as that is. This is Old Dirty Bastard. Uh, he was the lightning rod of the rapper band Wu-Tang Clan. Uh, of course, they don't exist anymore. He died after mixing tramadol, which is a painkiller, with cocaine. Uh, big mistake. And he overdosed. Chris Penn uh, was an actor and brother of Sean Penn. He died of a mixture of uh, promethazine, which is an antihistamine, and codeine. The combination gave him an enlarged heart, and he actually died of a heart attack. Uh, Chris Penn. He was in uh, Dirty Dancing. There's one that's pretty good. What was it? There's one of the True Romance that's pretty good. Though. He was the cowboy in the one with Kevin Bacon, the dancing movie. Footloose. Footloose, Footloose, yeah. Yeah, he was the cowboy. And his girlfriend was... Sarah Jessica. Sarah Jessica Perfect, yeah. Yeah, in that movie. <laughs> R&B singer Gerald Levert, Levert, I'm sorry, died from a combination of Percocet, Vicodin, Darvocet, Xanax, and two antihistamines. Uh, he mixed his drugs, probably a huge mistake. Anna Nicole Smith. Uh, she was a blonde. She was a blonde Playboy bunny from Texas who shocked the world by marrying a one foot in the grave, grave billionaire. Uh, she died with 11 drugs in her system, including Ativan, Cirax, Clonopin, Coral Hydrate, Lexapro, Valium, Noctec, and Zoloft. Two of those are antidepressants. She just kind of threw everything together, took a handful of them. She died in her hospital room. I know. Right after she gave birth. I know. It's kind of stupid. The day before her son overdosed on her. 
There you go. Uh, posthumous posthumous uh, Academy Award winner Heath Ledger died with six drugs in his system. Oxycodone, hydrocodone, um, Xanax, Valium, uh, doxylamine, and temazepam. Temazepam, of course, is uh, similar to, to diazepam. It's a, it's a, a, a benzodiazepine. Opiate, opiate, uh, anti-anxiety drug, uh, 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 <clears throat> Valium and, and Temazepam are both, as, they're very similar drugs. So he had lots of different drugs that were very similar to each other. I know, it's stupid. <clears throat> Michael Jackson had a number of drugs in his system when he died, but the combination that killed him were pro, 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 Propofol, Lorazepam, Medazolam and Valium, and of course these three are all benzodiazepines. And so he, yeah, well it was the mix, mixing of this with these three that killed him. Whoops, gave him, and that shot was given him by his doctor, as weird as that is. This is Corey Haim, if, if I was, who was I talking to? Oh, I was talking to Marius last night. He was talking about Lost Boys. Uh, this is one of the, yeah, the, the, one of the stars of Lost Boys was Corey Haim. He died of pneumonia, but the actor had been fighting drug addiction most of his life. He was found unresponsive with lethal doses of each of these drugs. He had a lethal dose of Valium, a lethal dose of Vicodin, a lethal dose of Soma, and a lethal, lethal dose of Halperidol. He had four lethal doses in his system when he died, but he died of pneumonia. He was able to tolerate four lethal doses, but he died of pneumonia. There we go. Amy Winehouse was a notorious drug experimenter who went through rehab several times before her death at 27. Once again, 27. Uh, she had started uh, several episodes of binge drinking and then abstaining before her death. Uh, one of her problems was she wasn't getting drunk enough. She, it, she, she was get, gaining a tolerance to alcohol. So she would abstain for a number of weeks and then she would start drinking again. She would binge drink. When she died, she had a, a level of 0 0.416 uh, ethyl alcohol in her system. I know, that's a lot of alcohol. That's a ton. 0 0.08 is, <laughs> is drunk. <laughs> uh, Whitney Houston had a not was a notorious drug mixer most of her adult life. People blame Bobby Brown. She was married to Bobby Brown, and everybody says he messed her up. But the reality was she was messed up before, he, before they got married. She was found drowned in her bathtub with high levels of cocaine, flexoril, Benadryl, Xanax, and marijuana in her system. Judy Garland had been a child star and had started a pattern of excessive uh, work days uh, fueled by uppers and downers. At 47, she died of a secobarbital overdose. That's the wind, right? Or are they doing something? Are they doing something? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Philip uh, Seymour Hoffman was a highly touted actor. He was nominated for four Academy Awards, of which he won once. He died at 46 from an overdose of heroin, cocaine, amphetamines, and benzodiazepines. Uh, people say he just died of a heroin overdose, but actually he had all four of those drugs in his system. He died with a needle in his arm. He shot himself up and he died before he could pull the needle out. Tom Petty was a rocker for four decades. Uh, he died at 66 with three forms of fentanyl in his system along with oxycodone and three types of benzodiazepines in his system. <clears throat> Tom Petty. Kurt Cobain died of a gunshot wound to the stomach. Dumbest place in the world to shoot yourself. Uh, he had excessive amounts of heroin and Valium in the system when he died, so he probably didn't feel it. But he died at 27 as well. All these people died at 27. Uh, Jim Morrison was the lead singer for the, the San Francisco band The Doors. Uh, Morrison considered himself a poet and a philosopher, as well as a singer. Uh, Morrison died of a heroin overdose in his bathtub at age 27 in Paris. Uh, he was no longer with The Doors. 
Janis Joplin was a rock star from the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, she partied with such iconic figures as the Grateful Dead and Country Joe and the Fish. As a matter of fact, theoretically, she was engaged to Country Joe, who was a Brit. He was Country Joe and the Fish. She died at 27 of a heroin overdose. 27 a year. Prince was a singer and songwriter from, 19, from 1980 until his death in 2016. His album, Purple Rain, is one of the most celebrated albums of the last 50 years. Uh, it had uh, more uh, number one songs on it than any other album ever, ever uh, that has ever come out. He died of a uh, fentanyl overdose at 57. And as I keep telling you, uh, he died twice, actually. He died, uh, he died the day before. They brought him back to life from a fentanyl overdose. He went back to Minneapolis. And that night, he overdosed again on fentanyl, so he was pretty serious. John Belushi was one of the major original uh, uh, players on Saturday Night Live. He played Joliet Jake Blues of the Blues Brothers. In uh, 1982, Belushi overdosed on a speedball at age 33, given to him by his girlfriend, the speedball, cocaine and, and heroin. <clears throat> Uh, River Phoenix was a child uh, actor from the, eight, the late 80s uh, who was headed for success. The star of Stand By Me and Indiana Jones uh, and the Last Crusade and Sneakers uh, died of a speedball overdose outside a club in Los Angeles, Los Angeles at age 23. Uh, he had a, a shot up inside the, uh, uh, in, inside the, the club and when, he, and when he came outside he collapsed. And because everybody was drunk, they just stood around and watched him die. As stupid as that sounds, but that's exactly what happened. Died at age, at, at age 23. Um, Joaquin Phoenix is his brother. I think those are the only two. Anyway, Chris Farley was a comedian of, of SNL uh, fame. Uh, he starred in uh, such movies as Tommy Boy and Beverly Hills Ninja. Uh, chubby little guy. He died of a speedball overdose at 33, like his hero, John Belushi. So possibly he was trying to die oh just God. like his, his hero. <laughs> okay, that's enough dead people. We won't talk anymore about dead actors <laughs> doing stupid things. At present, benzodiazepines are most widely used sedative hypnotics in the United States. Benzodiazepines vary in their half-lives and can cause tissue dependence for this reason, they can be highly addictive with severe uh, withdrawal symptoms. Most physicians only use benzodiazepines as short-term fixes for specific conditions. Um, and that was one of the problems with, uh, with Michael Jackson. Uh, he had been using uh, benzodiazepines not as a short-term fix, but as a long-term uh, method of going to sleep. And of course, eventually, you saw all of the benzodiazepines that the guy shot him up with to make him go to sleep. Uh, he was preparing for another world tour uh, when, he, uh, when he died. In order uh, of usage, uh, the most widely prescribed benzodiazepines are Xanax, uh, 34 million prescriptions, Ativan, 19 million prescriptions, Clonopin, 16.7 million prescriptions, Valium, 12 mil million prescriptions, and Restoril, 7.6 million prescriptions. A lot of benzodiazepines, as you can see. Lots of people are on this stuff. Benzodiazepines are used to reduce symptoms of anxiety and panic disorders. That's normally what uh, the reason that the, uh, people take them. To reduce anxiety and ha apprehension in surgical patients. Uh, every time I have surgery, they always give me a shot of Valium before I, before I go in. Unfortunately, Valium doesn't work very well on me. It doesn't really make any difference. I'm not all that upset about what's going on anyway. But they'll always give you a shot of Valium. So theoretically, it's easier to knock you off when you get into the, uh, the operating theater. Uh, to treat sleeping problems, uh, you can use benzodiazepines. Uh, not the best idea in the whole wide world because you become uh, you, you need this to, to go to fall asleep, and that's not a good idea. You need to figure out a way on your own uh, as to how to go to sleep. Uh, control skeletal muscle spasms, uh, control seizures, uh, dampen acute alcohol withdrawal symptoms, and that's why we use benzodiazepines. 
Side effects of benzodiazepine usage is very similar to alcohol. Benzodiazepines are most often abused in conjunction with other drugs as they are used to lessen the effects of withdrawal symptoms of methamphetamines, cocaine, and heroin. But remember, they're addictive as well. In one study, 100% of benzodiazepine addicts were addicted to other substances as well. So it's not something that you take all by itself. So one of the reasons why you, know, you saw all those people with benzodiazepines in their system as well as heroin or oxycodone or, or, or whatever. I mean, Elvis had 16 different drugs in his system. The typical uh, benzodiazepine abuser is a white, well-educated 30-plus female. Uh, benzodiazepine is one of the things that uh, females tend to uh, become addicted to. Uh, overdoses are very relatively common. Um, <clears throat> normally, when a male commits suicide, uh, he uses fairly violent but very rapid means of, of killing himself, uh, hanging, shooting, jumping off of a building. Uh, women tend to take drugs to, uh, to kill themselves, and usually the drugs that they take are benzodiazepines because it puts them to sleep and they never wake up, and that's what they're after. <clears throat> but of course, the probability of being caught uh, after having taken, uh, taken your pills is fair, fairly high. Uh, the probability of being caught when you jump off a building is zero. So make catch it. Uh, we've poked the stomachs of lots of different people <laughs> yeah, uh, to, to save people's lives. We, we've pumped a lot of stomachs. It's one of the things you do in the emergency. You get to pump a lot of stomachs. Do some of them wake up and they're like mad? Because they're not dead? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but of course they can always do it again. I mean, and this time they can hide and do it. I mean, it's not my fault. How, but what, what's going to happen now is they're going to be put on suicide watch. So they're going to have to, they're going to, have to wait for a month or so before they can off themselves. And they never come back. Usually, it's they, they were hoping to get fought, to be found. Some people leave notes, you know, leave notes in obvious places. Uh, the other thing that happens, we're going to talk about this. I think we're going to talk about this uh, later on. Um, your system will. Uh, you can take a, uh, an overdose of this, these drugs, and your system will adjust itself to that much drugs. So you won't it, it won't kill you. I know this happens all the time, especially with uh, with pills. So you don't have to you don't really have to pump their stomach, but of course we do <clears throat> to keep the uh, the pills from from doing damage. To Benzodiazepines work because they increase the effects of the inhibiting neurotransmitter GABA. It works on the cerebellum, the cerebral cortex, and the limbic system. Uh, the stronger the influence of GABA inhibits anxiety producing thoughts and overstimulation of neural messages. Benzodiazepines are met, uh, metabolized by the liver to produce more powerful metabolites. Uh, the original drug and the metabolites tend to stay in the body for an extended period of time because they are extremely fat soluble, so they tend to stay in the system. And of course, you can build up a level in your in your body, and you can overdose yourself even though you're taking the dosage that the doctor told you. It really all depends on how well your liver works and uh, your your the, the level of uh, body fat that you have or the muscle mass that you have as to whether you will overdose or not. Alprazolam or Xanax is used for generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and depression. Um, Halcyon is used for short-term treatment of insomnia, uh, seven to ten days. Uh, Valium is used for anxiety, skeletal muscle spasms, control of seizures. Uh, IV Valium is used as a sedative before surgery, as I said before. As cool as that is. Tolerance has, has to do with liver efficiency. Older individuals will have a stronger reaction than a younger person, so it's really tough for a young person to overdose on, on this stuff. Uh, it's real easy for an old, old person because their livers don't work as well. Especially if you're a drinker, uh, you're destroying your, 
Uh, actually, you're destroying your liver uh, when you drink alcohol because your, your liver has to clear all that stuff out of your system. So as you get older, if you're an alcoholic and you're, uh, you're a drinker and you take benzodiazepines, it takes a long time to get that stuff out of your system. It gets into your body fat. <clears throat> so if you're, if you're given a prescription of this stuff, the doctor doesn't know how much you drink, then possibly you're going to overdose on benzodiazepines at some point. Uh, you're going to start sleeping longer and longer and longer. Oh, uh, overdose of benzodiazepines can cause dementia-like symptoms in the elderly, and of course, they don't even notice because old people get dementia. That's just the way it works. Tissue dependence can occur with excessive use over several months or normal dosage over a year. Uh, because of the drug's lipophilic uh, properties, even small doses over time can cause tissue dependence and addiction. And this is the biggest problem. Uh, every pill that you take, uh, it's, it's going into your fat. Uh, so if they tell you to take three pills a day, um, you know, it takes <laughs> days to clear this stuff out of your system. That stuff just keeps building up. Uh, that's why it's a short-term uh, uh, solution for a long-term problem. If you use it long term, of course, you're going to, eventually you're going to overdose. But not if you're young. If you're old, you might as well just cash in right now. Withdrawal from benzodiazepines can be severe and take several months to taper off from the drug. Uh, the symptoms include recurrence of original symptoms, uh, magnification of symptoms, exaggeration of the recurrence of symptoms, uh, true withdrawal caused by low GABA and excess epinephrine and norepinephrine. The biggest problem is that uh, the reason that you were taking this drug to begin with was probably anxiety. Uh, it, it, uh, you get what they call the rebound effect, uh, where you go back, go back to the level that you were in uh, before you started taking your pills. Okay, so you had a select level of anxiety. Now it becomes worse uh, when you try to uh, go off of this stuff. Your anxiety comes back many times, many uh, times over. So your your anxiety is much much worse than it was before, and that's one of the withdrawal symptoms. Uh, and this is one of the reasons. These people rarely die of their withdrawals, but it's very very painful for them because the reason they were taking it before had to do with the anxiety. Now that now their anxiety is much worse than it was before. So they have to hospitalize these for people. I thought they were done. <laughs> oh, good. Onset of <laughs> withdrawal begins after one day with short-acting benzodiazepines and lasts for 7 to 20 days. Uh, for long-acting benzodiazepines, withdrawal uh, begins after 5 days and takes up to 28 days for symptoms to, to subside. A lot of times uh, drug abusers are using this benzodiazepines as well. So one of the reasons that they have to go to rehab is because of this stuff. Uh, they become paranoid and they become uh, overly, uh, their anxiety is, is multiplying. So they have to go into an asylum. They have to go into rehab. They have to go into a facility. Wipanol is a benzodiazepine that causes short-term memory loss and sedation. The drug has been used for short-term memory impairment and has been used as a date rape drug since the 1970s. This is the famous Roofies. If you've ever seen the movie The Hangover, this is the stuff that they took, that the guy gave them. He thought he was giving them ecstasy, and he gave them roofies instead. I know. So everybody was knocked out. Roipanol has been banned in the United States along with GHB since 1996. So how in the world is it getting back into the United States? Comes up from Mexico. Comes up from Mexico. They're never looking for this stuff. They're always looking for heroin and cocaine and marijuana. They're not looking for GHB and Roipanol, and the stuff's coming into the United States. Buspar is commonly prescribed as an anxiolytic and in combination with SSRIs to, to treat depression. Uh, Buspar uh, doesn't, uh, decrease, doesn't increase your serotonin level, and for that reason it doesn't affect your sex drive, uh, whereas uh, most SSRIs do. Buspar does not increase your GABA level. Uh, this drug does not seem to cause addiction and is rarely abused. 
This drug cannot be used to treat seizures, and for that reason, of course, uh, it isn't used for uh, uh, bipolar disorder. Lunesta is a hypnotic drug prescribed for insomnia. Uh, the drug increases GABA production, leading to relaxation. This uh, substance is only addictive when taken with another drug. Uh, Lunesta is the one with the great big green butterfly. If you've ever seen that advertisement on television, it's a Luna moth. Luna moths are like this big, they're huge. Lunesta. Don't you want to fly like a butterfly when you're asleep? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Placidil and chloral hydrate. Uh, Placidil is uh, actually a chemical ether. Uh, ether is the stuff you use to knock yourself out, or they knock, used, used to be used to knock people out. Chloral hydrate is actually three molecules of ethyl alcohol fused together. Who came up with this stuff? I'm sorry, alcohol is not strong enough. Let's fuse three molecules together so that when you take this pill, you get immediately uh, uh, inebriate. Let's do that. Both these drugs prescribed to, are prescribed to induce sleep and have long histories of addictive use and toxic overdose, mainly because people don't realize what they're doing. They don't realize that chloral hydrate is, yes, it's a pill, but at the same time, it's three molecules of, fused, of ethyl alcohol fused together. My God, this stuff will knock you out right away. I mean, you take it. That's, that's what they used to use uh, to knock people out, to kidnap them. <laughs> he's, got a, he's got a rhythm going down here. <laughs> he's tapping it one time and then he's hitting it. He's tapping it to to, to target it, to target whatever he's hitting, and then he's slamming it. Okay. There you go. <laughs> you know, as soon as class is over with, they'll they'll leave. <laughs> they always do that. They always work when I'm. They must be watching my, my PowerPoint. GHB is a rapid sleep inducer. GHB increases the body's level of growth hormone, HGH. But it affects sedation, disinhibition, empathy, sensory enhancement, and euphoria. It affects, its effects last for three to six hours. And so what happens is, this, you've got an open drink, this guy comes around behind you and he drops uh, GHB in your, in your drink and you immediately become sedated. So you're all, it, it, you look like you're drunk. And so he helps you out to his car. He, he'll take you in his car. But you're pretty much unconscious. But you lose your inhibitions. So because of that, now he's able to have sex with you. Uh, and it actually makes you uh, uh, very affectionate. So you lose your inhibitions and you become very affectionate. Uh, you can't remember anything, but you can feel euphoria. So you take the GHB, uh, or you take, <laughs> you get slipped the GHB, and now he has a really good time, and he leaves you by the side of the road after he's had a really good time, and potentially you think you have as well, but but actually you've been. You've been drugged and raped, unfortunately. And GHB is, is what it is. Lasts for three to six hours. Ugly stuff, ugly, ugly stuff. Uh, GBL and BD are uh, metabolized into GHB and in, in, uh, uh, the liver uh, metabolizes them into GHB. These two substances have been formulated into mint flavored rape elixirs. Uh, nitro blue, a blue nitro, I'm sorry, Revivrant, uh, Gamma G, Rimforce, and Insomex. Uh, if you ever go to a rave and somebody offers you any of this stuff, uh, potentially it's going to turn into that. Okay. Uh, if you drink enough of this stuff, it's going to knock you out. And uh, somebody may potentially be able to have their way with you. So you've got to be really, really careful when you're around 
people at a parade. I don't know how to tell you to stay away from these guys. Um, this is one of the ways that uh, they uh, will, will um, capture women uh, so that they can traffic them. Uh, they'll drop GH, they'll uh, give them GHB. The next thing they know, well, you, the, the little 14 year old that, that, that uh, uh, disappeared from uh, Albuquerque, they found her the next day in Louisiana. That's what they do, they, they just move you from that place to some place way far away. Especially if you're a little girl, you've never been, you've never traveled. So you have no idea, you have no idea how to get from one place to another. You're stuck, you're lost. And of course, they just give you this stuff and potentially they, they raped you. So now you're, you're stuck. You don't have a choice, you have to do what they tell you. So you gotta be really careful. These people are on the reservation. They were, they were, here, last, they, they were here last year, last summer. There, there was somebody in a FedEx truck that was following people around. Was it? Yeah, okay. You saw, you saw the FedEx truck. These people are here, so you need to be really, really careful. Don't take anything from them. It might be spiked with GHB or Roipinol, or it could be spiked with GBL or BD. This is how they get you. This is how they traffic you. And they'll take you someplace and you'll, they'll take you up to Canada. They'll, they'll ship you off to China. They'll ship you off to, to Africa. This kind of stuff happens. This is how they, this is how people get, uh, disappear. And this is the stuff that they use to do it. Quaaludes, uh, quaalude effects are similar to those caused by alcohol and linger for 60 to 90 minutes. The sedating effect lasts for six to 10 hours. This is a drug that is often abused in South Africa. Uh, why, why South Africa? I'm not exactly sure, but it's real popular. Quaaludes are very popular in, in South Africa. Uh, Lyrica. This drug is used to uh, treat nerve pain from the shingles or diabetes and can be part of uh, seizure treatment. Uh, if you see advertisements of the, I just saw a Lyrica advertisement last night. They were talking about, uh, um, wait a minute, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, they were talking about uh, psoriasis. Uh, what else were they talking about? Uh, fibromyalgia, Lyrica. Uh, more recently, it has been used uh, as a treatment for anxiety, sleep, and mood disorders. Uh, this substance is rarely abused alone. One of the things that you need to remember is anytime you take a drug, there's always side effects. Uh, it may work on what you want it to work on, but it may take something else away. My wife was taking a Fexer. A Fexer is a, an anti-anxiety and an antidepressant. And she wasn't depressed, and she wasn't overly anxious anymore. But it took away her emotions. She was no longer emotional. She couldn't show any emotion because she was taking this drug. So it's one of the things that you have to think about. Anytime you take something, something else may go away. Something that you don't want to go away. It's going to change, potentially it's going to change your personality. And so that's something that you have to think about before you take any of these medications. How long did she take it? I went to down to South America in 2003, and she started taking it in 2003. She went off of it in 2006. Back on in 2011, and she's been on it for eight years. Just, she just got off of it. So now when she calls me on the phone, sometimes she's crying. But before she... Well, I guess that's a good thing. Or maybe that's a bad thing. But now she, sometimes she, she cries uh, when she watches movies. Uh, before she could see the saddest movie in the world. No emotions whatsoever. What's it But all of this stuff will, will, can affect a lot of different things in your, in your system. So you need to be aware of that before you start taking Lyrica or a, uh, you know, Ambien, any of this stuff can really mess, or not mess you up, but it can change something about your personality. And you have to be uh, ready for that. This is, this is the list of things they give you after, uh, 
you know, at the end of the commercial. You know, it, it might affect your heart. It might uh, make might make you uh, urinate in your shoe or something. You never know. <laughs> okay. So most of these drugs, if you're going to abuse them. You don't abuse them, you have to abuse them with something else. I mean, them uh, by themselves are not going to give you a buzz. But if you, you know, drink alcohol with your Lyrica, now we got a good buzz going. Or tequila or gin or something, I don't know. Uh, Reserim uh, activates melatonin receptors in the brain. Uh, melatonin is a substance that helps maintain the circadian rhythm. It's used for short-term treatment only. Uh, when taken with alcohol, the result can be toxic. So they tell you not to take with alcohol. So if you want a, a buzz, then a lot of people will try that. They'll take it with alcohol and then they'll kill themselves. Whoops. And you'll ask them, what did you, <laughs> what did you take? And they'll say, I just took my medication. Okay. Did you take it with alcohol? Oh, yeah. Just had a couple beers. There's hardly any alcohol in beer. <laughs> These three drugs, drugs are no, uh, these three are known as the Z hypnotics. These are the ones that knock you out. Uh, these are the ones that uh, people use as, as sleeping pills. Uh, they can, they are short-acting drugs with one to four hour half lives. In other words, uh, these are drugs that uh, just put you to sleep, and then you have to stay asleep on your own. Their their job is not to keep you asleep, not to put you asleep to to sleep for an extend, extended length of time. Uh, their job is to put you to sleep and then you have to stay asleep for yourself. Uh, if you use too much of this stuff, it's going to cause nausea, headaches, diarrhea, and potentially drowsiness during the day. It'll stay in your system. This stuff is fat soluble, so it'll stay in your system. Uh, so I think uh, somebody's got a new drug out. Uh, VIX has a new drug out. It's called Z, Z, bunches of Z's together. It's got this stuff in it. And it, it, it allows you to go to sleep. It will knock you, uh, not knock you out. It'll put you to sleep. But it only lasts for about an hour. The rest of the time, that's what they do. But the rest of the day, you potentially may be drowsy. It may give you diarrhea. You may wake up with a headache. Uh, they're, and of course, they're not usually abused. Okay, that's... that's Let's talk about something else. Oh my, let's talk about something happy. I know, let's talk about alcohol. <laughs> the happy drug. Isn't that a, one that makes everybody happy? Yes, alcohol. Okay, chapter five. Good. I'm so excited. Let's talk about alcohol. I only have good news about alcohol. You don't get drunk? I, I know, I'm so excited. The majority of the people worldwide drink alcoholic beverages. Uh, this doesn't include Islamic countries. Uh, you, you may know some Muslims who drink. Uh, usually if they're away from their country, they, they, they drink. <laughs> I played soccer with a bunch of guys from Saudi Arabia, and those guys drank like fish, but they, they swore that they would not do that if they went home, of course. Quranic law doesn't allow you to drink. Uh, but Quranic law also doesn't allow, it uh, tells you that you can't drink uh, if, you're, if you're in your home country or something. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a way that these guys get around it. China's alcohol consumption has doubled since they've become one of the richest countries in the world. India's alcohol consumption has increased 50% because now there's a lot of people with money. And as you can see, sometimes they have a problem. 23% of English boys and 27% of English girls 15 to 16 were drunk three times or more in the past month. That's a lot, that's like a quarter of, of all those people. Uh, legal drinking age in England is 16. So most of these individuals, well, some of them are legal, some, most of them aren't. And those are three drunk English ladies. Uh, Russian men consume the equivalent of six to seven bottles of vodka per uh, capita per year. That's a lot of alcohol. They drink a lot more than we do in the United States. 75,000 alcoholics are homeless in Japan out of a total of 100,000 homeless. I told you I was going to give you good news, didn't I? Wait a minute. Let me see if I can find some. <laughs> Around the world, more than 2 million people died due to alcohol last year. 
a lot of different reasons to die. Approximately 10% of all diseases and injuries around the world were a direct result of alcohol abuse. There's a reason why I, I'm so negative about all these things. It's because when I was in the emergency room, this is what I saw. Somebody came in. We had a guy that cut his hand off. <laughs> he got it chopped off. And he came in. He was so drunk. Oh, the guy was so, I don't think he knew that what had happened. And he kept reaching for things with his stub. Oh, I know, yeah. I know, it was stupid. We kept having to, we had to tie his arm down, and he's pulling it out. Of course, he doesn't have a hand now, so he can pull his, his wrist out. We, you know, we tried to clamp down his wrist, and he just pulled it out. Oh, God, what an idiot. Anyway, a lot of times things happen. That's funny. Okay, that's not bad news. Last month, at least 126 million Americans, 52% of Americans 12 and older, had at least one beer, one glass of wine, or one cocktail. Uh, 16 million of this group are considered heavy drinkers. So there's a lot of drunks in the United States. They're not all on the reservation. As a matter of fact, you, uh, American Indians don't drink at a higher level than, uh, than white people do. White people drink at a much higher level. Uh, yeah, they do. They really do. I, if you've ever been around white people, they can put the stuff, they can put the juice away. They're really good at it. They're professionals. They've been doing it for thousands of years. You guys have been doing it for four or five hundred years. So they're better at it. They can drink you under the table, and they will drink you under the table just about every time. Uh, I, I had a student from Romania. This lady was not sensitive to alcohol. She could drink everybody under the table. She could drink the, a bottle, a fifth of, of schnapps and, and not get drunk. It was the most amazing thing I ever saw. But I convinced her to stop drinking because it still is doing damage to her liver. She just didn't get drunk, that was all. Uh, more than two-thirds of, uh, of the 11 million American college students at four-year colleges had one drink, and more than two-thirds of these drinkers had five or more drinks on at least one occasion in the past year. A lot of drunk college kids, and most of them are illegal. The drinking age in the United States is, is 21. Uh, so most of these kids are illegal. You're not 21 in college if you're a traditional student. You're not 21 until you're the end of your junior year, beginning of your sophomore year, or your senior year. About 6.2% of 8th grade students, 18.5% of 10th grade students, and 30% of 12th grade students have been drunk in the United States. All of these people are illegal. This is illegal for them to do this. They're all too young. How do we stop them from doing this? There's an argument out there that we should legalize marijuana. And the idea is, if you start smoking marijuana too young, then you make yourself stupid. Oh, wait, you, you lose IQ points. You rearrange the structure of your brain, in which case you're not real as bright as you could potentially have been. How do we keep those kids from smoking pot? Those 12-year-olds, those 10-year-olds. How do we keep them from smoking pot? We can't keep them from drinking beer or whiskey or whatever. If we can't keep them from drinking, how can we keep them from smoking? <clears throat> we know that alcohol is worse than marijuana is. But marijuana is bad. And it makes people stupid. And it stays in your system for a month. So you, you, you uh, just disturb your, your short-term memory. And now your short-term memory is affected for a month. So if I smoke this weekend, I'm, it's going to be May until my, my brain comes back to where it sh should potentially be. You blaze it up. Blaze it up, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. Oh, no, he's not. <laughs> he said that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I saw that on a movie. Yesterday, about uh, 25, $250 million dollars. Uh, was spent at bars, restaurants, and liquor stores for alcoholic beverages in the United States. $250 million. Yesterday, that's just one day. So there's a lot of alcohol being bought in the United States. I don't think there's much you can do to like stop it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think it's... Are we talking about alcohol or marijuana? Both. Both. Okay. 
So you're saying like how how can we stop it? How can we like limit or not limit it, but like stop the kids doing it? Well, the rationale with, with marijuana is, uh, well, it's, it's going to be illegal for those kids to use it. Well, that's not going to stop them. Mm -hmm. And they're making their, themselves stupid. The more you tell them to stop it or limit it, they're just going to... Sure. Mm -hmm. The rebelliousness I was talking about yesterday when I was talking about blazing up. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're rebellious until we're about 25 years old. Then our brain matures and we go, oh my God, how stupid was I when I was 18 years old. Yesterday, 7,500 brides and grooms were toasted with champagne in the United States. 25 to 30% of all hospital admissions in the United States were due to direct or indirect medical complications from alcohol. And of course, that irritates you to no end. Because this is all voluntary. Nobody drinks, un it's not an involuntary act, it's a voluntary act. So when they come into my emergency room, by God, they did it to themselves. So do I feel bad about it? Well, it's hard for me to feel bad about it because I have to I have to deal with this stuff. When you say direct and indirect, is that like drunk driving? Drunk like driving, hit? exactly. Yeah, oh. Direct, uh, they're alcoholics and okay. they're, they have a toxic level in their system and we got to pump their damn stomach. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the good thing about pumping somebody's stomach when they're drunk, when they've got a lot of alcohol in their stomach, it doesn't smell bad. That's the good thing. And usually they'll vomit on your shoe. This is just a, uh, you can tell this person's still alive. They're still nice and clean. After half of the murder uh, victims and half of the murderers in the United States are drinking alcohol at the time of the crime, alcohol takes away your inhibitions and it, it allows people to do stupid things. That's what was happening with that doctor that murdered his, his wife. Uh, he had been drinking the night before. He got pissed off at his wife. Uh, he was drunk, uh, woke up the next morning, with, a, with not just a hangover, but still the effects of the alcohol, strangled his wife to death. Uh, then he was very despondent, started drinking again, decided that he had to kill his daughters because he couldn't take care of them. So he did that. He, he, would, he took them out to a, an oil uh, well and uh, strangled both of his daughters. But he was drunk. He was drunk both times. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> more than half of the rapes that occurred in the United States involved alcohol. More than half. About half of the American adults have a close family member who has or has had alcoholism. And I have, a, uh, I have relatives who were alcoholics. But we're good white people, so we, we're really good at drinking. Or they think they are, anyway. <clears throat> in the United States, 2,700,000 crime victims reported that the offender had been drinking alcohol prior to committing the crime. Uh, I've, I've never, I, I hardly ever get into fights. I stay away from people that are aggressive as much as possible. But anytime I've been blindsided, anytime I've been punched, I was hit with a beer bottle, a full beer bottle. <laughs> hit me in the head with a beer bottle, right in the forehead. Uh, anytime I've been hit by somebody, they've all, they were always drunk, every single time. Um, I used to uh, accompany my friends into bars. Uh, I stopped doing that because they never pick on Travis, they always pick on the little guy. They never pick on the big guy, they always pick on the little guy. So just no matter what that big guy's been saying, when they come over, they always grab me. We, you know, Everybody wants to beat up the little guy. Nobody wants to big, beat up the big guy. Nobody wants to pick on the big guy. And then, of course, my friends are too drunk. I'm there to be the, the designated driver. They're too drunk to do anything, and so this guy just wails away on me. So I don't do that anymore. Never go to bars. Never, ever, ever. I'm always the target. Every year, alcohol abuse and addiction costs businesses, the ju judicial system, medical facilities, and the United States more than $184 billion, or more than 638 dollars for every man, woman, and child because somebody needed to have something to drink. <clears throat> I was stabbed in the stomach one time. I wasn't drinking at all. But my friend was so drunk he was insulting this guy. So the guy came over and attacked him with a knife. I got in between them because my friend couldn't defend himself and I'm the one that got stabbed. I can show you my scar. 
It's real pretty. <laughs> and I didn't have a damn thing to drink. Alcohol may be as old as a civilized man. Evidence of fermented beverages have been found in China that are at least 9,000 years old. A beer recipe was found on the uh, an ancient Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia dates back 7,400 years. So white people have been drinking for a really, really, really long time. <laughs> really, 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 really. <laughs> Alcohol has been used as a reward for pyramid builders, uh, as food for gra grain enriched beer. They use that in Egypt as well. Uh, as a cure all, they put. Uh, Opium, they mixed alcohol with uh, uh, opium, uh, and it, they called it laud laudanum. Uh, as a sacrament in both Jewish and Christian religions, uh, some Christian religions will have, uh, what do they call that? What do they call that when you, when you, what do they call that? As an offering? No. You get, uh, what do they call it? You, you, uh, you have to go to, conf if you're Catholic, you have to go to confession, and then they let you do this. What do they call that? Anyway, they give you wine. Some of some religions give you wine. What do they call it? It's not a sacrament. Such a bad question. <laughs> well, I'm not a Christian at all. Water substitute uh, with the contaminated water supply in Europe, of course. Uh, if you go to Europe, even to this day, you can't drink the water. Um, the only water you can drink is Perrier. Uh, you can drink the Sprungwasser which is bubble water, but you can't drink, can't drink, but don't go down to the river and drink out of the line. Supper? No, what is it? It starts with a C. Communion? Communion, Communion. thank you, Communion. Thank you. <laughs> Some religions use uh, wine to, to take Communion, uh, but others don't. Methodists don't, they don't ever, they drink grape juice instead. Uh, as a social lubricant, whenever and wherever it's used, as a tranquilizer for whoever uses it, and as a source of taxes, it is especially heavily taxed in the United States, and it's taxed very heavily in Europe. Uh, when I was overseas, uh, when I was over in Germany, uh, the Germans would make friends with us so that we would get buy them uh, alcohol out of the Class 6 store. We didn't have to pay taxes on, on any of the booze that we drank. Uh, as Americans, but they had to pay all taxes through the nose for uh, their alcohol. So our alcohol was like a third as expensive as their alcohol. So if I bought a, a bottle of, of Jack Daniels at uh, the Class 6 store, which is on the military base, it cost like five bucks. And if you bought it out on the economy, it cost 20 bucks. You know, the Germans just paid through the nose. Same way with cigarettes. So, you know, we could buy uh, cigarettes with no taxes. They had no federal tax, no state tax, because we were in overseas. But uh, the Germans, of course, had to pay through the nose. Throughout history, alcohol has been banned for, for its negative effects on its users. Uh, 2,650 years ago, alcohol was banned in China. 2,500 years ago, alcohol was banned by select Buddhist sects. The ban continues to this day. That's one of the reasons why Buddhists don't drink alcohol. Uh, the gin epidemic found 20 uh, million gallons of gin being manufactured per, per year. This is barrels, we're, or gallons, I'm sorry. We're, this is, we're talking about gallons here. We're not talking about a fifth. A fifth is a fifth of a gallon. This is five fifths of, of alcohol, Two, 20 million of these things. And this was gin. We're not talking about beer. We're not talking about wine. We're talking about one of the, the most alcoholic beverages of all time. Uh, the death toll was enormous. Uh, they started manufacturing it in the Netherlands. It spread throughout Europe. It spread into England, and the Brits just drank the stuff like water, and they, they killed themselves. Uh, it was controlled by heavy taxing in 1751, which reduced consumption, but that's all that they could do was to slow it down. Prohibition in the United States with the uh, 18th Amendment was ratified by 46 out of 48 states by 1920. Uh, Iowa was the 29th state to ratify the amendment. I don't know. Oh, that's when I was living. Okay. It was repealed by the uh, 21st Amendment in 1933. This is an amendment to the Constitution. 18th Amendment uh, prohibited the sale and manufacture and sale of alcohol in the United States. And it lasted for 13 years. 
So prohibition lasted for 13 years. And we're going we're gonna to discuss whether it worked or whether it didn't work. Alcohol prohibition or even control uh, have often run into sto to a stone wall. Attempts in sub-Saharan Africa to control beer consumption has been impossible because of the fairly nutritious uh, home-brewed beer that provides a modicum of grain. The P Pilgrim loved their grog. Uh, this idea followed through the revolution as alcohol sales and taxation provided needed revenue to finance the war. We financed the Revolutionary War on booze. S taxing booze. That's how we made enough money so that we could fight the war. Temperance began in the United States in the 1840s but wasn't successful until 80 years later in 1920 when we started Prohibition. But Prohibition actually started in 1840. So there were a lot of people that were saying alcohol is bad. If you watch the movies, it looks like every cowboy drank whiskey, a lot of whiskey. But the reality was some of those states, including this one, had Prohibition. <laughs> Why don't we stop right here? I'll pick this up next time. <laughs> More good news. I got only good news about alcohol.